No buzz. At Jespy's Book Club. Today we're talking about a book that I don't have physically because I've given away like a half dozen copies of it. Uh, it's a reread, baby. Um, for a book club, even. Uh, no, 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 not a no, no buzz book club. Um, a, a book club that includes people other than bees? Unthinkable. I'm in too many of them. Um, I reread Yumiri's uh, Tokyo Ueno Station. Um, I wasn't even the one who picked it. Um, it was uh, a book I read initially, I think, in late 2020, maybe early 2021 for the first time. Um, I picked it up because, uh, well, because <laughs> it's short, honestly. Um, I think it was right around the time I probably read um, uh, Ogawa, Yoko Ogawa's The Memory Police. Uh, I think they were sort of both in the in the store that I work in uh, around the same time, and I was like, I think on a little kick of like, I people ask for Japanese authors, I too readily go to Murakami because of my own history, even though I'm not super interested in his work um, these days. Uh, and I um, I just don't, I just didn't, I just wanted, uh, you know, I wanted, I wanted some other shit. Uh, <laughs> and uh, part of that other shit was turned out to be um, Tokuyo Ono uh, Memory Police, also quite a good book. I think I've talked about some other Yoko Ogawa here. Um, I don't remember if I read Housekeeper and the Professor before I started this, but definitely uh, sort of recently read uh, Hotel Iris, which was a, a, a interesting one. Uh, very good in, in specific ways. Um, but yeah, uh, Tokyo Ono Station is sort of very high level, is narrated by a man whose name I forgot because it's mentioned like once over the course of the whole book. His name might be like Moro or Mori might be the last name, something along those lines. Um, uh, he's a man who sort of elected to become homeless in his sort of older age. Um, I think it's like in the 60s, I believe, around when he um, just moves out. He's already retired, definitely. Um, so maybe like late 60s, early 70s, um, and he goes to live at the uh, park nearby Tokyo Ueno Station, in Tokyo, obviously, um, and sort of before the beginning of the book, he dies, um, and so it's narrated from him sort of like in a sort of flying camera third person, first flying camera first person perspective, um, where he just sort of like bounces around between his previous life and things that are happening sort of now-ish um, and talks about like the homeless encampment, um, his history like having been born in 1933 and having a son the same day as uh, the the emperor's the, the, sorry the crown prince's son is born I think not the emperor maybe um, son named Koichi, which is specifically like takes the the final character off of the crown prince's son or the crown prince can't remember which uh uh and this is like in in, in 55 maybe 52 55 something like that whatever so somewhere around the general macarthur era if not immediately succeeding it so the emperor has already sort of abdicated the throne as a condition of the surrender of japan at the end of world war ii after um, the truly reprehensible acts by the United States government of the firebombing of Tokyo and the dropping of the uh, the atomic bombs on Hirosh Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, uh, the sun's born, the emperor is still a huge thing, obviously. Um, and sort of his life, sort of doing construction work. There's the Olympics happen throughout here. Uh, well, sort of one, the 68 Olympics or whatever it is, uh, 66 Olympics, something like that in Tokyo. Uh, he's like there, you know, digging ditches uh, to, to turn into soccer fields or whatever the fuck. Um, he's also there in the construction boom of the late 80s uh, that, that results in the bubble in the 90s um, and, the, and the recession, obviously. Um, 
and then ultimately he uh like sort of ends up living with his granddaughter for a little while as his caretaker like she's just become a nurse when he's finally retired um and he ends up sort of going like i am this is like pretty late into the book that you actually learn this but this is all early on in terms of preceding the the, the assumption of the narrative um he ends up basically being like i'm a drain on on this person and it just leaves and goes to live in a homeless encampment he has a lot of conversations with folks um and then dies and then sort of floats around and is like well fuck me uh, i guess i gotta keep living um i think the like the biggest sentiment in this book that like fucked me up uh both times that i read it is his there's a line that he has i did, Pretty sure I didn't write it down. I do have like a tiny bit of notes here. Um, yeah, he uh, he doesn't. I didn't write it down, but he says something to, along the lines of like, "I I was able to adapt to any kind of work. The only thing I wasn't able to adapt to was um, life." Um, and so that's both one extremely relatable to to a B, um, and two. Um, existentially and thematically extremely depressing because he's a because he's dead he doesn't have to do it anymore but he's still telling the story and it's just overwhelming um yeah um I, i'm not a i'm not a historian of japan although i did i did have done some research especially when i was thinking that i was going to pursue a career in uh, academia of some sort or another and uh, one of my sort of uh, inroads to that was an attempt to write a very long history of uh, kawaii aesthetics and, and resistance basically I, you know recently going through a bunch of my old books and remembering that i i bought like a lot of like academic texts and read them about the history of of like specifically leftist movements in japan especially around the um uh like the post Meiji Restoration era, um, but back into there as well, um, trying to sort of, and especially specifically student movements is, is I guess what I was like focused on because of Kawaii as an aesthetic being um, sort of originated in um, the the notes that schoolgirls would pass to one another. So Kawaii originally sort of means like cute handwriting more than just cute in general. Um, and then it sort of um, absorbed up into the marketing machine mostly not mostly, but, um, you know, mostly in terms of things I'm in day-to-day -day contact with. Uh, where is, where is your cinnamon roll, cinnamon roll back there? There you go. Um, uh, it's by the Sanrio Corporation, um, creators of Hello Kitty, Kuromi, Cinnamon Roll, Little Twin Stars, Kuropi, uh, My Melody, uh, Batsumaru. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, I'm, so point being, I'm not a historian of Japan, but um, I, I have at least some sort of pseudo-academic background. Um, and, and one of the things that I think struck me initially on the first read, but like really struck me on a reread, is like how much this this little novella is um, is enriched by a, a, a bit of knowledge about the history of Japan, sort of like the, the socioeconomic sort of like broad scale um especially um but also is is like is one of those things that feeds back into itself i guess is, is a is a way to say it um having a bit of that knowledge and then reading this book makes you want to go back in and like pull, pull back more of that knowledge and also gives you a little a little bit of context a little bit of a, a history from below sort of um sort of situation um which is you know uh, it's no other way um a, a man a man makes man makes their own destiny they just don't choose the situation in which they do it kind of a vibe you know what i'm saying um it's butchered marx quote from the communist manifesto just in case you didn't know um yeah and, and like um and going back into it also like uh i the thing i definitely missed last time um or didn't miss last time is uh that it's my assumption that this book ends in the 2011 tsunami in fukushima um that, that led to the nuclear action, reactor meltdown um but i didn't know that in 33 and, I, and when we were 
talking about this, I guess it was brought up in the in the book itself, but it kind of glossed past it, I guess. As there was a huge tsunami in, in 33 as well. Um, so, you know, uh, this is about 100 years worth of Japanese history. I guess if you're ending in 2011, but you're publishing this in 2000, I think it was initially published in 2016. But, you know, now it's 2023. Uh, so that's 100 years uh, minus 10. <laughs> Christ me, Jesus Christ me. Um, I've, I've derailed myself. This is a history. This is a you know a near century of, of Japanese history, sort of like embodied by this one person. But this person is dead, and so therefore they aren't they aren't embodied, um, as it were. Uh, that is also the history of one tsunami and another tsunami. Um, it is also the history of you know the. I mean, 33 to 45 is the, the rise uh, and consolidation and uh, crumbling of um, specifically Japanese imperialist fascism, but then the, um, you know, the, the land reforms that happen that lead to the, um, oh god, the, the, the Demo Democratic Party of Japan, the NDP, I think. Um, I'm just muttering to myself at this point um, because I'm not clear enough on this to convey it to people. I'm just trying to remember it at this point. So, point being, uh, <laughs> this book is, is a beautiful, I mean, it's, it's extremely poetically and elliptically written in certain parts. Um, it is a beautiful sort of history of Japan that like is um, taken up in very specific and different ways that I um, am only kind of aware of. Um, but that make me want to be more aware of it. It's, it's a big part of, I think, what I what I truly loved of it. Um, and then, do do do. Okay, so I already got most of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna end it on this quote that I wrote down, um, which is from a section in which um, this is when the our our POV character is. Um, is homeless and has been for a, a number of years at this point. There's another um, another character of a lead named Shige. Um, I, I have very bad handwriting, so I can't tell if that's exactly what it says, but that's my memory. It's Shige. Um, there's a moment when um, the sort of POV character goes back to the park, um, and this dude named Shige, who's sort of just like a, a, a font of, of Japanese historical knowledge, um, sort of invites the narrator or the POV character back into his tent and offers him a bottle of, of warm sake um, and both of them are not, are not drinkers at all um, and sort of opens up to the POV character a little bit or tries to um, specifically I think he says it's his son's birthday Shige's son's birthday or um, graduation or something like or maybe the day he passed I don't, I don't remember exactly what it is but it's a significant milestone in his son's life um, and he's not there for him obviously he's he's living houseless in the park and they, they have a couple drinks um, and um, the and Shige sort of opens up and, and starts talking but the our POV character does not really um, reciprocate um, partially because his own son has passed away at this point um, at like 21 years old um, long before um, partially because uh, the character just has a hard time opening up to people and um, and for reasons that I think are as have a lot to do with his own like narrated life that I don't need to get into the details of because you should just read this fucking book. Um, but the narrator sort of thinks to himself after having sort of accidentally um, shut down this potential opening up. Um, Secrets are not necessarily hidden things. Events that do not bear hiding become secrets when no when one chooses not to speak of them. Um, and that really, really hit me. Hey. Thanks for not watching. I appreciate it.